Yeah, I'm keeping up your talk today about chronic interfaces. Uh, yeah, so I work at Sourcegraph, we do developer reference tools. Mostly around code search and code understanding stuff. Before that, I went to Facebook for some developer activity. And that's kind of where I learned the gospel of my chronic interfaces. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so I'll be talking about what it is, why they use it, and how. Um, so I think the best way to talk about what I'm going to think of code base is very just talk about generally what kind of repo environments end up happening in companies. Um, quite a common one these days is the per project thing that's kind of inspired how GitHub, open source, all that kind of stuff works, where you have a project, say it's down to like a microservice level, like the auth service, or up to like a whole project or a, a, project, a product that you ship to people. It all just lives in one repo, and you have separate repos for each different thing that your company does. Um, then another very common thing that happens as companies start to get bigger is you have a per language repository. So as you start getting bigger, you start investing like, oh, let's make, we use a lot of Java, let's make the CI for Java really good. Um, let's make all the tools, and it all ends up in one repo because people just get all the tools for free. Um, they put a new Java project in and maybe just does everything magically. And then they'll have another repo because they do data science, and those guys only use the same repo, um, etc. And it kind of evolves where you like, you start to share things between your Android code base, your iOS code base, etc. And you kind of realize copy and pasting is not ideal, or using like, or maybe doing semantic version doesn't work so well for you. So you just do one main repository. And that's kind of what a lot of big companies do. So places like Google has been doing it basically forever. Um, and I think that's because their history started with the force, and before that, something else probably, which just encouraged uh, one, one repo. Um, Facebook did it. Kind of did it for a long time uh, because they started with SVN and creating new SVN repos as much easier as Git because Git didn't exist. Um, and they kind of evolved from there and then Git existed and then other repos existed and they realized it sucks so they merged into one repo. Same thing with Twitter. Twitter's quite famous, has a lot of resources online where they talk about how much they hate their multiple repos. There's a Twitter account called Wanna Reply and they basically had like three big repos, I think. And they just talk about how much it sucks. Because things get out of there. Like the one they have, they fork the bolt to the other one. And, uh, they didn't like it. Airbnb running mostly does it, and a bunch of other companies also publicly talk about that they use monographic repos. Um, I think I haven't mentioned this yet. Um, monolithic repos don't mean like monolithic services. It's like complete orthogonal. It's literally about the bounds you put your, like the way you choose to divide up your repositories. Nothing to do with how you actually structure your applications. Um, one of the groups just give you more flexibility. Um, so the reason why all these big companies basically do, do it boils down to developer productivity. Um, if you just have one repo, once it's there, you just use all your standard tools. There's no extra layer of abstraction to like manage repos, update dependencies between things. It's just one repo. And you run HG, or you run Git pool, you're going to get commits across a bunch of repos what just happens. Um, so it's super frictionless. Um, this makes it very easy to share code. So uh, kind of like including a repository, uh, creating a new library and then like sharing it amongst repos is not like something that's just instantaneous to do. Um, but if you have everything under kind of like one, if your tool can just read files, the file is there. So your bolts will just go to say, oh, it's up right there, let's include it. There's no like fetching something from the next there's no versioning. There's none of that, it's just there. Um, which makes it super easy to share code, things get reused really easily. Things are easy to find because everything's just in one place um, with a sensible repository structure. Um, and related to that, it's very easy to, uh, to just change all the code in the code base. So say you've got some library that's used a lot, like some string utility library, and you, you really don't like you've added like a parameter which is a boolean saying yes or no and it does something different. And you realize that's a terrible idea, everyone's using it. It's very easy to actually change it and every, everyone that uses it in your company gets it straight away because you just send out, you just send out the, you write a, a refactor or a you like write a, you write a job to like automatically just refactor the whole code base, then you just commit it. There's no like lag or where people suddenly start filling in the dependency um, you don't have to poke people to say, hey, update your package.json to include my fix. It just all happens. 
And when you're in a large organization, this is very important because um, if these things don't get updated, you have you kind of incur a lot of technical debt. Um, so making incentivizing and making really frictionless to update things really just encourages your code base to stay healthy because it's easy to keep it healthy. Um, another great thing is kind of an operational or a lease point of view, or maybe just speaking with other developers about things, is that if everyone's kind of working against master, um, and there's just one master no matter what you work on, it's really easy to understand like, what is the state of things right now, because you just look at master. It's not like multiple regions kind of sub-modules or something like that. And it's also really going to see what was there, what was now a week ago. Um, and this has some cool operational stuff, depending on how you set up your lease engineer. But like when things start to go wrong, you're diving into stuff, you can look at graphs and like, oh, the graph kind of started getting funny a month ago. You can actually just then go look at your nice linear history a month ago and see kind of a change in that area. The other great thing is it's really easy to write tools when you just have one namespace, or not namespace, one repo for everything. Like if you can just, as I said earlier, like read a file, not, you don't have to know how to run Git, you don't have to know how to run Material, or anything like that, you just know how to read a file, things just work. So like writing a build tool that checks things across dependencies or static analyzer that goes and searches inside dependencies, doesn't need to know anything about source control, it just, just reads files. Um, I kind of mentioned some release model, I'll explain a little more later. Um, another big reason companies do it is actually completely, nothing to do with technical reasons, it's also to do with the culture that it encourages. Um, when you like join Facebook or Google or something like that, you clone and you get the code for everything that they do on your, or essentially everything that they do on, the, on your laptop or your dev server. Um, and you can change any of them. And they also, what they do is when you've got one big repository, they're heavily invested in uniform too. So you want to try and change uh, the ad, ads code for some reason. You know how to really build a ground test and all that because it's consistent across the whole code base. You know how to find it because it's kind of like there's a, there's a decent layout with stuff. There's no like just trying to find repos or manage repos. Like, there's no weird stuff going on because everything's consistent. Um, and the really cool thing about that is if you ever get blocked because some API or IP that you depend on um, is broken or doesn't act up the way you want, or doesn't support some feature, there's, there's literally nothing stopping you from just adding the feature and then setting up the code to for it. Um, this, the same can be said um, for uh, when you have lots of repositories. Um, but the difference is that when you contribute to the smaller library, you can also fix all the other people that use the library. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about like doing backwards and kind of changes because it's all just in one repo. The other interesting thing about the cultural aspect is when you don't have, what tends to happen when you have a bunch of repos is that people kind of get siloed. They never really look outside their namespace. Um, it, it actually encourages, it make, encourages making it easier for people to like change teams which is an important thing in big companies because otherwise you get churned. Like people just like, get tired of the thing and change jobs instead of changing teams. Um, and the whole real thing. So the idea behind this is like you move a bunch of projects around and you're, there's no like, oh, we have to move this code from one repo to another, which is kind of difficult. This is literally just a get move operation. And things are kind of falling in a different way of organizing stuff. And it's just completely easy to do. And the whole like encouraging people to, as I mentioned like in the beginning, you can just contribute to other things because if everyone controls their own repo, then you can't like just stop people from uh, you don't need like commit access to a repo, you just get it for free. Um, so sometimes it's a good thing, most of the time it's a good thing, I guess sometimes it's not the best thing, but it depends on your company culture. But then there's also like technical reasons why or technical things or classes of problems that monolithic repos just solve. So the, the most classic thing is the diamond dependencies. So if you have, you use a library uh, which, I don't know, gives you authentication tokens, and then you use another library which uh, puts like something on someone's timeline, just for a Facebook example, but they both use a string library underneath that, the same string library, but they use different versions of it. How does that compile? Like, what happens? How do you keep things up to date? When you have a monolithic repo, there is no such thing as vendoring different versions. Everyone uses the same version. 
that problem just completely disappears. Um, and because of that, in the last point there when I say users of libraries get breaches when upgrading a hard update library is frozen in time. Those problems go away because if you want to update a library, you update it for everyone. So if you get updated, it's you the one that has to solve the issues that maybe crop up if the, the test group will get someone to fix their thing on the new version of the library. It's kind of like, instead of delaying finding out that something breaks other people's projects, you find out straight away. It's like really feedback. Um, the other thing when you have lots of repos is that you, know, you don't have to maintain a lot of Travis, or a Travis YAML file for every repo, or a circle repo, a YAML file, whatever your CI system is. You just have one. Um, and when you add improvements, it happens for everything. And so this, I, this is quite a really big, um, it's basically, so a lot of stuff I've said, you're like, well, this, this has nothing to do with one of the big repos versus um, uh, using a bunch of smaller repos. Um, because, you know, you can just write something which manages all the repos. The thing is, to make something work really smoothly, uh, it's actually really difficult, and it's pretty, probably as difficult as making monolithic repos work for these large organizations. So you might as well just do monolithic repos because you have a nice simple interface there. Like this, you only have an you don't have like some other command, like an Android, that got some, I think the tool's called repos, to manage all the Git repos. You don't need that, you just have Git. And then there's other questions like, how do you actually decide the repo boundaries and all those kind of things? They become questions that it don't really matter, you just do the file, like you just do things by directory structure, which you just do. There's no like flat namespace, like all project, like on GitHub, it's just do whatever you want, that makes sense. Another, and this is related to what I was saying about the factory, is that sure you can uh, make a bunch of small services and they all speak to each other, all microservice architecture, and then you know, you should design good APIs that don't really need to change anyways. But like, who's ever written an API that's perfect the first time? I don't think that ever really happens. At least you may have done it before. Um, so the nice thing about one with the repo is you realize what you've done and you screwed it up. It becomes really, really easy to make all your downstream consumers of your API use your improved versions. And because everything's kind of connected, when you do changes, you run the t everyone else's tests that depends on the library. So if everyone is invested in the whole testing culture, you can be really confident in changing your code. So yeah, you pretty much, your code stays healthy. Yeah, so I mean, it's, there's obviously downsides to this. Um, it, you pretty much, you have to invest into it. Um, nothing just works, it doesn't just work. Uh, you have to have a portion of your engineers, instead of making your product better, they make other engineers' lives better. Um, and a very interesting uh, aspect of this is because it's so easy to just pull in dependencies, um, it kind of hides the cost of what a dependency is. So a really interesting example of this, which is kind of related, is that the whole NPM ecosystem died recently because everyone just included a library that like, strips a string or something like that. Um, using a dependency actually has a cost. Um, and this makes it so easy to reuse code is that you don't actually realize the cost of including a dependency. So the kind of slight artifacts of this is like, you can include a library and say you're running it in C++ or Go or something like that. Suddenly your binary size balloons because you use one tiny function which you pull in the whole library. Um, uh, other things is, it's basically like, because it's so easy, you use too many dependencies and it's harder to understand things and things operation don't work so well. So you kind of need to invest in trying to improve that situation. So I know Google, for instance, they have bots that like search the old dependency trees, and if you include a library which you use a very small fraction of it, they automatically flag it and say, hey, you probably should just not use this or copy and paste what you do. Yeah. All right, so I've talked a little bit about why people use monarchy repos, but there's some really interesting challenges to actually make that happen. Um, a lot of them have to do with the fact that as things get really big and the histories get really big, you actually get limitations of how fast the machine can act. And all your tools, if they have algorithms that like, work on 
reasonable size that they kind of fall apart. Um, so the very first thing is the way, the first thing I want to talk about is like actually how do most modern repos work is you do kind of like, if everyone said you use SVN, you kind of just pretend you're using SVN. You have one central repository, you, everything goes against master, everyone develops against master. Um, when you create a release, you create a branch for the repo. The other thing is, you don't really create branches to do feature developments, you just create them to do releases. Um, instead of doing branch feature development, you create patch sets. Um, so instead of like the pull request model, you use something like Garrett or Fabricator, or what the Linux kernel does with like just email patches. But that's nice. Um, the, the cool thing about this kind of um, way of doing things, the release process is really easy to understand. You declare on Sunday at 10 p.m., I'm going to take what's currently in master and I'm going to release that on Tuesday. And then you just switch everyone to like go for that. So you just branch master off and you say this is the release branch. And then as you come across issues, you just people still develop against master, but then you cherry pick changes into your release branch. Um, then you release it, and then that's what's running in um, running in production. It's very easy to like understand this is what happened in production, this is what's actually there, this is where it came from. And then when you do a new release, you throw away the old release branch. It's just there for historical reasons. Um, so you have no crazy like merging patterns that happen by GitFlow or anything like that. Um, so I said I was mentioning scale, like what is scale? Um, so this is an example from a slide I found about Google talking about like scale. Um, so the total number of files, which includes like auto-generated files, documentation, uh, configuration, stuff like that. They've got a billion files and they're working properly. Um, of that, nine million is only nine million of the source files, which is a lot. Um, but I also think that one billion includes files that were once there and were deleted. Uh, two billion lines of code, a shit ton of history. Um, you can't still learn without help. Uh, yeah, 45,000 commits a day. That's great. Um, so what kind of scale issues happen with, this, with those numbers? Running a git status suddenly doesn't work anymore. You can't look at every single file and expect it to return in like, without you to get a cup of coffee. Running clone, you, you, running clone means with the normal git repo, it means that you transfer 86 terabytes to your laptop. <coughs> that doesn't work. Pull fetch, because you're having 45,000 commits a day, Running pool fetch is a slow operation because there's a lot of change on there. Um, large working copy size, it probably doesn't fit in the laptop. Uh, yeah, even if you don't have the history, just in the shadow of it, you still have, they don't say the size of their working copy, but I'd imagine that's probably what fit in your laptop. Um, and then when you've got 45,000 commits, it's not straightforward just to push something because there's, at least with Git, it's, it's serial. There's no like, so you guys aren't touching the same files, if I can take both of you, it's like, you take one, you take the next one. Um, so things that they do to solve this. Um, so for a long time, I think Google hasn't been running any source controls we've ever used. I think they started with Perforce, then they made their backend work on uh, basically Bigtable, all the stuff that they do to run Google code search, run Google search, then they made their front end work on uh, make their own custom file system. So you don't have to check out the whole repository. And they still just work uh, perforce to each other, two things, even though there's no perforce. Um, what Facebook did was for status was they just wrote a daemon. Um, because then Facebook's working copy size is still like a few orders of energy less than Google's. So just running a daemon, uh, which uses like normal notify services, normal notify APIs, that worked pretty well, except no notify service actually works that well. It's a very large working copy. Most things work in small repos. So there's a lot of work on that. Um, and they did that from Curio and they published this called HD Watchman. So people can use that uh, for free. Uh, clones, um, what they did for that is uh, you don't clone the whole history. Um, you only clone the metadata of the whole history. 
And then if you need to fetch a file, it goes, it goes and speaks to memcache. So your, your HG client actually doesn't speak to the server, it speaks to memcache. And Facebook's really good at memcache. So that's why they did that. Um, pool fetch, same thing, because you install the metadata, it's not that bad. But the metadata becomes a bottleneck, so all the metadata is stored in like the MySQL table. So you can just fetch um, subtrees and stuff like that. Um, work and copy size. Uh, the build tool speaks to your source control tool and tells it what you need to build this thing, and it only fetches that from the network. So you don't actually have anything checked out. And then push contention, you don't want developers sitting at their laptop running git push or HG push with a little bash for you. Um, so, or the rebase to their road service, which basically pulls it in and just lands it to just push a button. Um, and that gives a bunch of other functions as well. So those are the sort of things that happen just on source control. Then you also need to build and test at scale. Um, so an interesting thing about how CI scales is that as your engineering board grows, they write more tests. But, as, but they're at the same time, they're also writing more commits. So as N, which is the number of engineers you have, you actually grow N squared because you've got more tests, but you also got more commits in the end. So it actually becomes really difficult to scale CI. Um, the kind of thing that you normally do is you make a really small build tool and test tool, and then you run the builds and tests that need to be run. Um, and uh, the other thing about that is you kind of want to make everything consistent, otherwise every time someone uses a new language or there's a new project, you kind of have to like rejig the CI server. But if everyone just speaks one build tool, your CI server just does that. Um, and then it's the same, it's also good for the developers because, for example, they just know how to run make. So they see the into direction of make and they get their build artifacts and they get their tests rather than having to read documentation. The other interesting thing is that because your CI kind of gets so big, um, and there's like stories at Google and at Facebook as well, like the infrastructure people would give as many servers as you wanted to, to run CI. So you have like thousands or tens of thousands of servers just running builds and tests. And they don't mind spending money on that because they're kind of really valuable. Um, but what happens is when you have tens of thousands of servers all running big code against the model of the repo, is that you kind of like hose the model of the repo. I mean, you're, you're hose the other server. Um, the other thing that happens as well is you have like an outage for some reason. Then all your CI servers come online again. And then there's a thundering burden and everything just goes down again. So it's like, your normal distributed computing problems happen even in your development infrastructure. Uh, so you need to start doing smart things around like distributed consensus to prevent these things or just the standard uh, exponential uh, you can. There are solutions for this, so you can use that at your own company if you want to. Uh, Google open source what they actually use internally, it's called Basil. Uh, I don't think they've open sourced all of it yet. Um, it's pretty it's, it's actually so good before they open sourced it. Both uh, ex Google engineers, when they joined other companies, they were into the rewriters because they didn't have access to it. So, this Buck, which is really good at building Android stuff, um, and then there's Pants, which is really good at Star and Python, I think. Both are written by ex Google engineers that would you know, let Google out of the line and get to this back. Um, but if you actually want something that manages everything, uh, you actually see CI service, something that runs the worlds, the things that like, coordinate everything, I don't think anything exists for that. Uh, code review. Yes, yeah, so I mentioned earlier, uh, pull requests don't work, you can't just push branches all over the place. Because um, it's all just a flat name, so it's basically branches. So what a lot of these companies do is just patch based. So when you uh, send a code review, instead of pushing something, you just send, you just take a diff between yourself and Origin Master, and then your, your uh, tool uses that. Alright. So basically, our conclusion is that one of the three ways they do it because it increases the level of productivity, but there's a cost involved. And that for an organization, you have to be willing to develop, uh, invest in develop tools. Uh, I have some resource links here. The top one will take you to the slides, so you can just click on other stuff. There's really good talks. Um, this why Google source billions of line talk, talks. It's really good because you lots of inside information about how Google works. Can, like I said, that slide was from earlier. Um, there's a few other really good posts. 
the top link will take you to the slides. You can just click on those links. Um, that's all I got. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, so if you guys put one release watch and you're changing, uh, let's say, the dependency for mobile projects, then your release tool needs to be smart enough to know which upgraded versions you need to add uh, at the same time. Otherwise, you might break into project dependencies. You, you kind of, you don't, you kind of, what, what they generally do is it's, um, there's a regular release cadence. Just like Chromium or uh, Go releases every few months, and Tony may be every two weeks or something. So whatever is in master, you're just releasing it. Even if no changes have happened, there's always been changes. But you're just always releasing it. So different projects have different release cadences depending on the risk involved with releasing. Um, but yeah, you don't have that issue. And because you're always running master, and it's generally really good release engineering tools where internally you're always running the latest stuff, you pick up on the issues before releases. Uh, how long do people spend fixing other people's code? Take one to It's not that, so it depends on the maturity of the tools. Um, generally, things test run before you submit your diff, while you submit your diff, once you get it to master. Once it's in master, it's running continuously. So they try and catch it as early as possible because then the person that broke it, it's, it's closest, closest to them. Um, but saying that, obviously things broke. Um, and the way Facebook solves that is there's an on-call rotation for like major projects and they'll get alerts if the master's broken. Um, and generally, the, the philosophy is don't fix it, reverse it. So you don't spend too much time, but it is, there, is a, there is an overhead. And some repos, they're so confident in the reverting and the test tool, they just want to make you revert. Um, yeah. And because it's so easy to write tools, things like a test suddenly breaking, uh, it'll just, because you've got to learn the history of your get by saying that it's pretty easy, and automatically creates a task. Like there's lots of workflows that will make it, or that can be automated. So generally, the person that breaks it fixes it, or one of the code workers, like in the immediate area. So it just because it's good for the big guys, does that mean it's good for the guys as well? Um, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's like strictly better or worse, right, than you're doing other ways, other ways of doing things. I'd say it's, it's good for, for the little guys as well, just because it's just less like cognitive overhead. Like just one big repo, everything happens in there. Just one thing to look at. Um, most of the time that I see uh, incentive around making smaller repos is if you're sharing the code with the outside world, because that's how the outside world is. That's, that's just fine. Yeah. You if you want to release like a portion of your internal software as open source, mm -hmm. then do you, do you use the, what has now become the upstream version, or do you just maintain the um, version? So the way Facebook that it is, they have parts that just sync pull requests between things. Because they the ones, they run it on the internal CI, because the internal CI is good, but they also don't want to directly expose all those tools to the outside world, because it might need information. So generally, because it is better for contributors to use GitHub, they use that and they automatically sync it with internal systems. But yeah, I think some projects do just use upstream. I don't know which ones. None of the big ones are the React ones are all these kind of things on Facebook using channel stuff. Yeah? Uh, would you take this if not all of the internal teams are equally mature in the usage of tests and test coverage? I mean, yeah, no, no, for sure. Some things have no tests. Um, but then it breaks in production and people get angry at you. So you kind of learn through osmosis. But um, at the end of the day, if things don't break down by tests, the tests are not happening. So kind of things balance out to a mix of stuff. Can you have a model source now? Uh, no, not a lot of open stuff, but everything private is on repo.
Well, you do manage your private, I mean, your open source stuff, open source stuff should be good deal. If it's, I mean, it's not worth estimating our stuff because we might have paid it. But uh, if it's an open source project, it's a, that's just one. Like, it's, we have used micro to open source sort of stuff. And it's annoying because you have to vendor everything in, and then things get out of gates because people forget to update it. Vendor new things in. So, uh, yeah. We use a lot of benefits. So, I get, I get the uh, value of the, the model repo. Why? Like, in a smaller team, surely, like, still doing branches and stuff. I couldn't imagine working on every way of a master be like an absolute doctrine. Like, I mean, and then how much your branches live for? You know, a maximum of like two weeks. Not, not you know, I mean, I guess it depends on your code velocity. Really. Like, two weeks can be really long or can be really short, depending on how many things are touching. But I know every time we've had a long running branch, it sucks. So I'd rather than use feature flows. Work fast and monthly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're running, a, if you got a service that's running in production, you kind of, you probably want to use feature flags to have the features, and then test them against users if you have it. I mean, the nice thing about like, if you at Facebook, you've got the the good thing that you actually have skills, you can do really good A/B testing. Like I don't know, the way I'm working right now, we don't have nearly as much skills, so we don't really get as many benefits. Other than just, it, it's annoying when someone like does a refax of how we use React and your code doesn't work anymore. Because they've been doing that for two weeks in the 